Our first reading is from the book of Exodus, chapter 16, verses 2 to 15. And the whole congregation of the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the people of Israel said to them, Would that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the meat pots and ate bread to the full? For you have brought us out into the wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I am about to rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a day's portion every day, that I may test them, whether they will walk in my law or not. On the sixth day, when they prepare what they bring in, it will be twice as much as they gather daily. So Moses and Aaron said to all the people of Israel, At evening you shall know that it was the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt. And in the morning you shall see that the glory of the Lord because he has heard your grumbling against the Lord. For what are we that you grumble against us? And Moses said, When the Lord gives you in the evening meat to eat, and in the morning bread to the full, because the Lord has heard your grumbling, that you grumble against him, what are we? Your grumbling is not against us, but against the Lord. Then Moses said to Aaron, Say to the whole congregation of the people of Israel, Come near before the Lord, for he has heard your grumbling. And as soon as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the people of Israel, they looked toward the wilderness, and behold, the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. And the Lord said to Moses, I have heard the grumbling of the people of Israel. Say to them, At twilight you shall eat meat, and in the morning you shall be filled with bread. Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God. In the evening, quail came up and covered the camp, and in the morning, dew lay around the camp. And when the dew had gone up, there was on the face of the wilderness a fine, flake-like thing, fine as frost on the ground. When the people of Israel saw it, they said to one another, What is it? For they did not know what it was. And Moses said to them, It is the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our next reading is from the letter um, to the Ephesians, chapter 4, verses 1 to 16. I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. In saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he had also descended into the lower regions, the earth? He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and all the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our last reading is from the book of John, chapter 6, verses 22 to 35. On the next day, the crowd that remained on the other side of the sea saw that there had been only one boat there and that Jesus had not entered the boat with his disciples but that his disciples had gone away alone. Other boats from Tiberias came near the place where they had eaten the bread after the Lord had given thanks. So when the crowd saw that Jesus was not there, 
nor his disciples. They themselves got into the boats and went to Capernaum, seeking Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me, not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For in him God the Father has set his seal. Then they said to him, What must, what must we do to be doing the works of God? Jesus answered them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him who he has sent. So they said to him, Then what sign do you do that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never, never thirst. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now let's see the Apostles' Creed together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Thank you for reading, Mary Beth. That's a pretty good portions of scripture there, right? Yeah. This morning. But I think you can see how some of them tie in together. So uh, for the next three weeks, you're going to notice something that uh, we transitioned from the book of Mark into the book of John chapter 6 for the next three weeks in our le lectionary. And I think this is because they want to engage Jesus fully as the bread of life okay so this is lord willing how we're going to kind of break it up okay so today we're going to talk about the bread of life satisfies right john 6 and 35 next week we're going to talk about how the bread of life raises it's kind of a play there light and raise right okay right and uh, john 6 and 40 and then august 15th the bread of life abides okay so we're going to talk about that over the next three Sundays. So we've got a little series here, okay, that we're going to do on the bread of life. So we're talking about the bread of life satisfies. Something you might find interesting that I did. Every year, Americans spend about $500 million on Twinkies. <laughs> Twinkies. Yeah, everyone knows what Twinkie is, right? Yeah. Well, there's a couple of meanings to that, but I'm talking about, you know, this one. Yes, you, you heard me, right? Twinkies, Okay. Those golden cakes, the tasty cream-filled treats that taste so good but have absolutely no nutritional value. There's been all kinds of jokes about Twinkies, right? That they're, after a nuclear winter, they survive and people are eating them because it's the only thing in existence, right? Because you, you can't destroy them, right? I mean, you can even buy them fried at your local fair. Sounds interesting, right? <laughs> And the truth about Twinkies reminds me of something. That so many people are hungry, but they fill themselves with the wrong things. So many things that have no nutritional value, they're empty, they're unsatisfied. They're really hungry for God, but they don't know it. So they eat Twinkies. We love what tastes good, but often forfeit 
what we really need for healthy bodies and minds. It's just our nature, right? Just live in Louisiana for a while. That's the truth, right? Yeah. Fried and cream-based, you know, everything. So it is also estimated that because of hunger, it's not only that kind of hunger, but 20 million people in the United States need professional treatment for drug and alcohol abuse. The alcohol abuse in Louisiana is awful, the drug and alcohol abuse in Louisiana, especially in Livingston Parish. And others, and I have noticed, and I thought it was bad in Whitehall, but it's bad here. The policemen I talk to all the time said most crimes, everything that goes on is usually something alcohol related. Now we're not against drinking alcohol, but the scripture forbids drunkenness. Everybody knows that, right? Just to throw that in is a little scripture there, okay? Everybody with me? Mm -hmm. But why are people doing this? That's what's worrying me, right? Why are people doing this? Do you know, U.S. citizens spend over $50 billion each year on illegal narcotics to dull their pain and have some sort of momentary happiness. They are medicating themselves. Right? We do it with drugs. We do it with food. We do it with alcohol. My drug of choice is a good lasagna. You with me? Come on. We are searching for something that will give us happiness and fulfillment. We're hungry. And we are medicating ourselves in some way to get relief from the pain of life. Hungry souls. We are a hungry nation, but often for the wrong things. But Jesus presents himself as the bread of life, the answer to that hunger. A bread that gives life and a bread that that satisfies. Are you glad for that? Yeah. You know, satisfies. When you think of the word satisfaction, what comes to mind immediately? I can't get no. I can't get no. It's actually like the number, I think it's like the number two song in history. Right? I think there's one above it. I forget it. I read it, but I forget which one it was. But it's like, I don't get no satisfaction. As soon as I hear that words, I hear the guitar riff. Right in the beginning of it. You know, everybody know what I'm talking about? And Frank, my brother-in-law, who lived downstairs in, on Ridgecrest Avenue in Staten Island, he loved the Rolling Stones, right? And, he, and you'd hear him, he'd come in after work, and they had albums back then. Now, albums, uh, young people, are these big, round, uh, wax things that you put on there. And you could play them at 35 or 45 or even 78, and that's something else. I had, I have to tell you about that sometime, probably haven't seen that one, right? But my brother was always an instigator, okay? He knew exactly what to do to cause some trouble or to make something funny happen, okay? So we lived upstairs down, my sister and my brother-in-law Frank lived downstairs, and he was putting on the Rolling Stones album, and my brother knew just where to jump on the floor to make that album skip. And he'd jump and he'd go, and you can hear Frank downstairs, hey! <laughs> so that's what I think of when I think of, I can't get no satis satisfaction, right? I can't get no satisfaction. You know, in Greek mythology, there appears a character named King Tantalus. The king had drawn the wrath of the Greek gods and he was punished in the afterlife by being chained to a lake. Lake waters reached to his chin, but whenever he tried to bow down to satisfy his thirst, it would, it would go down. If that wasn't bad enough, over his head were branches filled with fruit, but they immediately moved up and beyond his reach whenever he tried to get to it. King Tantalus had been immortalized by an English word, tantalize. The story speaks of things that promise to satisfy, but they never do. Instead, they tempt and they torment. But satisfaction remains just out of reach. Despite our labor and our best efforts, no matter where we look in this world, we, are never, we never quite find what we really think will satisfy us. Let's be honest. The pursuit for more stuff, financial security, more money, and, you know, we think that we'll finally have what we need if we have all of those things. We'll take two jobs, hoping to get rich and to finally have some sort of rest and contentment, right? But of course, as we can see from the richest of the rich, satisfaction seems to elude them. Have you noticed that most of the most rich and famous people I have are a little cray-cray? Yes. 
Have you ever noticed that no matter all the characters that catch our attention and, and fill the news, the news, no matter how royal, no matter how rich, no matter how famous, they seem to be, well, miserable. Our dissatisfaction comes from that kind of, so we want to be like them, you know. We, we have this uh, idolatry toward these people, you know, when one of them dies or something happens in their family. Guess what? I want to let you in a little secret. You don't know them. You have no idea who these people are. Except you see them on TV, they've been immortalized, they're famous, and most of them have got some serious problems that really I don't think it's a great thing to imitate from politics on. Everybody's got their favorites. Why? So our dissatisfaction causes more constant searching and, and more dissatisfaction as we look for a happier home life. We're in a therapeutic age now. Everything's about therapy. And I'm not rejecting this. Therapy can be very helpful, but it's not all about therapy. It's not all about your feelings. Sometimes feelings just need to be put on the back burner. Because feelings change with how much sugar you had the night before, or pepperoni pizza. And I'm not talking about any clinical stuff. I'm not making fun. But I'm just saying is, is that a lot of people love to, to go into therapy instead of just dealing with some real issues, right? Like, you are in the mess you're in because of what you did. That's more than not. Now, there are some other side things, but that's... Hello, don't look at me that, like that. Right? Because we're looking for something. We're searching for a medical treatment that'll work. Oh, it's not going on right now. Right? Oh, we don't like it. We want a cure, but we don't like the cure that's given us. We want, we want something to help us, but we really don't like that. We don't trust the government. We don't trust. We're just jacked. We don't know what to do. I'm with you. I don't either. We're searching for stuff. We're searching for more recognition, more vacation, more income, more security, more something. The search never ends. No matter how satisfied we are for a moment, that moment always passes. The problem, of course, is the things we are searching for are perishable. Everything that you think is going to make your life better right now in the temporary, I'm not saying it's not necessary for here in, in life, but it's going to perish. As the old preacher used to say, Brother Mike, he said, it's all going to burn. Right? We can see, we, you know, that in Louisiana, that houses and, and stuff can just be removed by a single flood. Couldn't have been worth much. Everybody remember the John Rockefeller? Remember dating John Rockefeller was one of the richest men in the history of the world. He was asked by a reporter once, how much money is enough? He responded, just a little bit more. Jim Carrey, some of you have seen him, comedian, well-known comedian, actor. He's made plenty of money. Recently, we've recently done a graduation speech, which I probably would have enjoyed. And this is what he said. I hope everybody can get rich and famous and will have everything they've ever dreamed of so they will know that it's not the answer. So I hope you get everything and you realize, just like Solomon did, and by the way, you don't have to do that. You can just read it in the Bible. It's called the book of Ecclesiastes. So you don't have to go and do that. You can just read about a guy under inspired scripture and it'll tell you what happens when you get everything. And it's all vanity and vexation of spirit. He had the women, he had the wealth, he had, he had power, and is miserable. Of course, that's the effect of idols in a life. They always put satisfaction just out of reach. You know, Martin Luther in his large catechism while discussing the first commandment, those of you who have been in education now, we've gone through this, he, he, thou shalt have no other gods before me, right? The first commandment. What does it mean to have a God, he says, or what God? Answer, a God means that from which we are to expect all good and to which we are to take refuge in all distress so that to have a God is nothing else than to trust and believe him from the whole heart. If your trust is false and wrong, you do not have the true God. You're worshiping a false God. God. I don't know how many of you have seen this. It's not in the book of Jeremiah, but there is the Bible series by Jeremiah. And I really like, there's a couple of portions in there that are pretty strong. 
But near the end of the movie, there is one quote that hits hard. Jeremiah says to Zedekiah the king, and he's in his courtroom, and he says, instead of erecting monuments to false gods, make your life a living monument to the word of God. And Zedekiah says, it is as my people desire. Jeremiah says, but you are king. They look to you for leadership. Your pursuit of your own pleasure, wealth, and power has taught the people to trust in false gods. You have led them to believe that the one true God is not enough. And that's what money, wealth, power, the pursuit of education, all these things that I'm not saying you don't need them, but if it is your be all and end all, which it somehow ends up being that way, it becomes something that becomes a God, an idol. By trusting in our earthly possessions to deliver and save us and seeking them for help, we make them idols. Idols always bring bondage and destruction. It's interesting that the idols that Israel turned to were always the nations that invaded them and brought them into slavery. When they worshipped the gods of the Assyrians, that's who came and got them. When they worshipped the gods of Babylon, that's who came and got them. You always are in bondage to the things that you worship. We seek these things. Now, Jesus addresses a crowd that by all appearances was seeking him. The Bible says they were seeking Jesus, right? But were they really? You know, Jesus has a way of pulling the cover off of things, doesn't he? In verse 26, Jesus says, Truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Jesus, the true antidote for satisfaction, always tells the truth. Isn't that right? We need the truth. We need the amen. We are not seeking him. We are seeking to fill our hunger with things to do, that do not last. Come on, folks, are you with me? It's very American. It's what we do. And if we want to admit it or not, that's what our whole life is, is around. We are seeking to fill our hunger with things that do not last. And Jesus and verse 27 says something awesome. He said, do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you, for on him the God the Father has set his seal. Earthly food and bodily possessions, Jesus said, will all perish. Yes, food is God's blessing. Let me stop here and say, in case you're wondering, I mean, Jesus fed 5,000 people, at one time, 4,000 another with loaves and fish. And the Bible said in John 6 and 11, they had eaten to their full, right? But as it always does, their hunger returned, right? No matter how much of a good meal you had, you're hungry. Especially if it's good Chinese food. What is it about Chinese food, right? You have good Chinese food and then an hour later you're hungry again, right? And it's kind of this with our lives, right? But Jesus tells us to work not. Did you see that? Work not as if our chief concern with earthly food. Now, he's not endorsing laziness, okay, but emphasizing to us that it's all temporary. Because in the end, in all that we obtain, in all that we have, in all of our stuff, it perishes. Think about the stuff you've got in your house right now that you don't even use. Think about your attic and your shed and wherever it is, and you're just trying to rearrange it, you make more sheds, right? Or more shelves, or you're, stick, you're trying to get stuff up in the attic, and you can't even get to get up in the attic because there's so much stuff. What are you doing with all of that stuff? It's time to take some stuff to the Salvation Army and give it to somebody that might be able to use it. Just a thought, but, you know, just in case. I might need it. Right? I had a guy in our church, a poem that was like that. And you go, man, it was like, you know, now you got people that are hoarding. <coughs> right? But it's all temporary. And when life is done, what is left? All our stuff. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. Or as Brother Lewis, my father-in-law used to say, he said, there's no you, or we used to tell him too, there's no U-Haul 
behind the hurts. You're not taking it with you. In fact, Ecclesiastes says you work all of your life and you labor for all of this stuff to leave it to somebody else. And I watched it in our house next door. I did the lady's funeral. Very nice lady, Debbie. All that stuff. Her kids never really, I'm a br brutal here, didn't really help, didn't really clean up. The place was always ready. But boy, when they were ready to sell that house, man, and they're going to get some money out of it. Woohoo! That house and everything else and everything she had and everything is now somebody else's. We've gone to some estate sales, just one estate sale. My wife's tried to get me to go to some others. They like to go. It's, you know, it's like, what do you call that when you go out on Saturdays and yard sales. It's a royal yard sale, okay? That's really what it is. You get in these houses and I got me a cross out of the whole thing, all right? But it's amazing, but it's sad when you go through the house seeing everybody's stuff. Those people are gone and all that's left is their stuff that you're going to get at a discount. All that they labored for, all that they needed to live, what is it now? Are you getting what I'm saying? Yes. <laughs> what is it now? And when, <laughs> when you get like I do, when you get fourth stage cancer, you're not worried about the lawn and how much is here and what's going on here. You're concerned about things that matter, like your family, like your relationship with God, like going to church, like things that and you realize in that moment what is really the most important thing in your life. You're a Christian after all. But Jesus said all that, and did you know the people totally missed it? We miss it, right? Jesus said, work not for those things that perish, but receive the gift that God gives, right? And they missed it, right? And all they heard was, don't work for this, work for that, work for this. <laughs> all of us have this work-based, performance-based mindset. We seem to always miss the gift. Then they said, what must we, I love this, what must we do to work the works of God? So they go right to the works. Okay, Jesus, you said we could work. Okay, what can we do? And Jesus said, not, you notice he changed the words. They said, what must we do to work the works? He says, this is the work. <laughs> not works of God. To believe in him whom he has sent. What? What? Work what? Believe? We do not work faith, but God works faith in us. Amen? Amen. Jesus removes labor and our lists and our metrics of self-made righteousness by saying, do not believe right, in what you do. Believe in what God has done. Stop trying to justify yourself before God with how much money you have and how much relationships you have, and what's your education. That's just a self-justification. We love that, man, this, this uh, thing that we do to show people how we, virtue signaling. Isn't that what they call it now? Virtue signaling. You know, we think we're more righteous because we have more, or a better education, or my kids are nicer, or my, my wife's a you know, trophy wife, which I got one. I'm sorry, all right? But if, you know, if I got I, I'm, I'm proud of that, right? But we got, we got this... Things that we virtue signal. You know, I don't take the vaccine. I took the vaccine. Virtue signaling. I'm good because I don't trust the government or anybody. I'm not going to take it. But I'm good because I love my neighbor more and took mine. Virtue <laughs> signaling. Now, I'm not binding your conscience. You do whatever you think is right before God to do. All right? But I'm just telling you right now, it doesn't make you more righteous. Yeah, I, don't be mad at me now. Some of you look, don't be. Well, I'm right, and I'm left, and I'm center, and I'm Republican, and I'm a Democrat, and I'm a Libertarian, right? Or right, whatever. So? So, in the end, I, I guarantee you, if Mr. Trump walked down the street, he wouldn't know you, and neither would Joe Biden. And neither would Nancy Pelosi, or neither would your governor, or whoever it is. They don't know you. And you make you getting all upset, fighting with your relatives over stuff and everything else. What the heck is that? Man, I am really preaching now, right? Yes, Somebody back. said he stopped preaching and gone to meddling. <laughs> right? But Jesus said, don't worry about that. all that work. 
God works faith in us. He removes the labor. And he says, if you're trying to work for it, it's not grace. For the scripture says, and if it's grace, it is no longer by works. For if it were grace, it would no, if it were works, it would no longer be of grace. It's that simple. Jesus has provided everything you need. When Jesus shows us, he is the only one that really meets our need. Jesus in John 6 and 35, watch this. I am the bread of life. Give us this bread, they say, that we will never hunger, right? They're thinking about the manna. By the way, interesting, manna, if you look at it in Hebrew, it's uh, ma, M-A, na, and N-A. M-A in Hebrew is a question mark. N-A in Hebrew is an exclamation point. Manna, that's what I, that's what I translate it. What is it? Because it's like when you say the word, it's like trying to say a question mark and an exclamation point put together. What is it? Manna. They couldn't even describe it. It's like coriander seed. It's this white stuff. I like the way David describes it as angel food, right? That's the real angel food, okay? Right? But that's, that's what it is. But all this work-based stuff is not going to justify it before God. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. This is the bread that you need. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger. And whoever believes in me, all right, shall never thirst. What a promise. Amen? I am the bread that gives life, real life, eternal life. And we're, we know that we're hungry and thirsty every day. But we need daily bread. And Jesus provides that bread. By ultimately, Jesus says, I'm the only thing that will satisfy you. Amen. When Jesus promises us he can relieve hunger and thirst for good, man. He's talking more than about food and drink. Luther calls it spiritual hunger, right, in his works. To satisfy it, Jesus offers something which does not perish, namely himself. You excited about this? He alone is imperishable. He alone is risen from the dead. He alone will never die. In his grace, he promises all who come to him and who live in faith will live an abundant life eternally. This does not mean we'll always be satisfied with everything in this life. And instead, it means our desires will be shaped and met by the one who only can satisfy our hunger. This bread of life, Jesus Christ, Promises satisfaction. You can come to Jesus and know you will be satisfied. Only Jesus and his love and righteousness can satisfy. Only he can make us right with God. Psalm 17 and 15. I love this scripture. As for me, I will behold thy face in righteousness. I shall be satisfied when I awake with thy likeness. Oh man, that's awesome. That's when I'll be satisfied. One day in heaven when I awake with Jesus' light, then you'll be satisfied. Then everything you thought you needed will mean nothing and you'll have everything you need. Praise God. The Bible says he satisfies the longing soul and the hungry soul. He fills with good things in Psalm 107 and 9. Bible says, blessed are the hungry and the thirsty, for they shall be filled. That's where we, I was loving that in the chosen. That's where Jesus lives. That's the people he hangs around. It's the thirsty and the hungry, because they realize that he's the only one that can satisfy them. The Bible says he satisfies the afflicted soul. The Bible said in Psalm 22 and 26, the afflicted shall eat and be satisfied and those who seek him shall praise the lord's may your hearts live forever oh i like that scripture amen are you afflicted are there things going in your life only jesus can bring the satisfaction and here's one more facet of the gospel that meets our culture and its point of need jesus christ gives what the world cannot give satisfaction you don't know how to satisfy God's demands. His demands are perfect. You can't even satisfy your own petulant demands. But the good news is Jesus satisfies us because he satisfied the Father by his death and his resurrection. He, we may not always feel like he satisfies us, but the truth is, is that only Jesus satisfied the Father for us, uh, as us, uh, and he receives the satisfaction he has, and he offers that satisfaction to us. 
He is the bread of life. Jesus paid the debt of our sin and removed it from us. He forgives our idolatry and our seeking other things. And he welcomes us home and puts bread and wine on the table because that's what you need. That's really what you want. Isn't it interesting the thing that we seek so much of food and everything else? He makes it a sacrament. So it will truly satisfy us with his forgiveness. He gives us himself. Now listen, as we get done, if you're a baptized believer, you are saved by God's grace. And God is satisfied with you. So you can be satisfied <laughs> with him. When you realize that God is satisfied with you, you ever hang around somebody that likes you? You tend to like them more. <laughs> Isn't it true? You don't want to hang around people that hate you. That's not usually our MO, right? No, so you've been around, has anybody been around a place where you felt very uncomfortable? Yeah. You know what I'm talking about. You really want to be around people that like you. So if you know somebody who was satisfied with you, you tend to want to be with them, right? Come on now. And God has satisfied you in the most ultimate way. He has forgiven your sins. Praise God. He looks at you as holy and blameless and righteous. Hallelujah. Isn't that great? He sees the holiness of his son who swapped his purity for your sin, meaning now you're pure in the father's eyes. What performance could you possibly render to add to that? What could you work for to add to that? Beyond placing your faith in Christ, you don't have to do a single thing for God. And really, he gives you the faith so you can place it in him and even lifts your arms so you can offer it to him. Isn't it great? Yes. God is satisfied with you. Everybody say, God is satisfied with me. Satisfied. Because, of Jesus. because of Jesus. Now, a lot of folks will call this cheap grace that I'm preaching today as I finish, but it's anything but cheap. It seems cheap because the price was paid by somebody else. I think it's unconscionably expensive, but overwhelmingly generous. And God's loving us beyond imagination. Even in your seeking for other things, even in your striving to go after other things, God is always there loving you. And when you see Him, you'll realize that we used to sing a, a song. We don't always sing in our church. Maybe we should. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full into his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Amen. There's something about Jesus. He's the bread of life. He's real life, real bread, and real satisfaction. Now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And everyone said, amen. 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 Would you bow your heads and would you pray with me? Father, thank you so much for the bread of life which came down from heaven. Not an earthly bread that perishes just one that has to be gathered in before the dusk or turned to worms. But God, you give us your son, Jesus Christ, the true bread from heaven to satisfy us and to give us eternal life. And there is no other life outside of him. Father, today, thank you for giving us the faith to believe in the forgiveness that you've given us. And Lord, let us continue in that faith, by your grace, Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Today, Lord, we want to pray, Lord, for all those that are recovering from illness and all those that are sick today. And we see many people that are still sick with this COVID and people that are sick with other things that are going on. And we miss them today. And we pray, Lord, that you would be with them, that your healing hand would be with them. And Father, I thank you, Lord, for your protecting hand. I just pray, Lord, that you would protect our church from sickness and from disease. And Lord, if sickness should come our way, that you'd bring quick recovery. And 
that we learn whatever we need to learn through those times of suffering. And Father, I just thank you, Lord, for your gracious mercy, knowing that this life is not all there is. There is the resurrection of the body, where there'll be no sorrow or sickness or any such thing. God, we give you the glory for these things and ask you to continue to heal us. Lord, in your mercy. Today, Lord, we want to pray for our nation, as we always do. We pray for our president, our vice president, our congress, our senate, all federal government, all state government, all local government, that you would bring them the repentance, the true knowledge of Jesus Christ, and the grace that only you can offer. Lord, in your mercy. And today, Lord, we want to pray as Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen? Amen. The Lord be with you. Amen. Let's get ready. Come around the altar as we get ready around the Lord's table.